So today I'm going to present a case to you with a complete history, clinical science, physical exam, as well as lab diagnostic results, just to give you an opportunity to get your critical thinking turned on and to learn a bit about how to read these lab results. So I'm going to talk through the whole case. It's going to be from this book, Canine Internal Medicine, What's Your Diagnosis by John Ray, which I really, really recommend. And I hope it's going to be a fun video. Today, the following patient presents at your clinic. An 11-year-old male border terrier neutered, weighing in at 10.4 kgs, presenting with lethargy, anorexia, vomiting, dullness, and a reluctance to walk. There's a previous history of self-limiting vomiting, lasting two, three days, which happened four times over the last six months. And over the last two weeks, the owners noticed an increase in water intake and an increase in urination. There's weight loss, but no skin coat abnormalities. And the dog has vomited eight times in the last 24 hours, vomiting up bile-stained fluid. Let's look at the physical exam we do, we perform on this patient. On physical exam, we notice the following things. The dog is depressed and overweight with a body condition score of four out of five. We see sunken eyes and normal skin turgor is lost. The mucous membranes are tacky. They have a normal color. The capillary refill time is two and a half seconds. Heart rate is 144 per minute. Respiratory rate is 32 per minute. Temperature is 38.3 Celsius. The peripheral pulse quality is poor. And there's normal oscillation over the heart and the respiratory system. And on palpation, we notice cranial abdominal discomfort, but no structural abnormalities. These are the labs, hematology, biochemistry, and urinalysis of this patient. Now is your moment to take a good look at these labs and think about what you're noticing here and what might be causing it. So let's start looking at our patient's lab results together, starting with the hematology. We see there's a heightened total white cell count with some heightened neutrophils, this we call neutrophilia. And in this case, it's only a marginally elevated neutrophilia. We've got a low amount of lymphocytes, lymphopenia, with heightened monocytes, this is called monocytosis, and low eosinophils, this is called eosinopenia. Let's start discussing our neutrophilia here and look at what could be causing neutrophilia. There are three main causes. Inflammation. stress, or corticosteroids, and exercise, or epinephrine treatment. In case of inflammation, we will see a left shift. This means it's not included in our current results, but we will see younger neutrophils. This is not the case for us right now. But in inflammation, we will see a left shift, and we will see marked neutrophilia. And our case is really just marginally high. So we're going to disregard inflammation for now. Um, neutrophilia is caused by stress. We'll see mild neutrophilia. And this is often combined with lymphopenia. So a little bell should be going off for you here, because this is our case. We have lymphopenia, and we have really a mild neutrophilia together. So we're going to feel pretty confident that this is a typical stress leukogram that we're seeing right now. In case of exercise induced or epinephrine induced neutrophilia, we would see a mild increase, but we will see it combined with lymphocytosis. So actually a higher amount of lymphocytes. And in our case, we have a lower amount of lymphocytes. So this is a typical stress leukograph. And I will mention that inflammation can also cause neutrophilia and monocytosis, as is the case here, but it wouldn't cause lymphopenia or eosinopenia. So we're gonna stay with stress causing this and nothing really crazy else. Moving on to take a look at our biochemistry, there's some really interesting things going on here. Let's take a look here at the total protein. It's marginally elevated, 78 instead of 77, which is the range. But when we look at the albumin and the globulin, which 
together make up the total protein, they are actually both within normal range. So we're not going to spend too much thinking about why this might be so little elevated right now. Moving on, let's look at urea. This is often written down as blood urine, urea nitrogen. And we always measure this together with creatine to check the kidney function. Urea in itself is not so dangerous, but it is excreted by the kidney. And if it's higher, then we understand that it's for some reason excretion is weak. Uh, on the other hand, creatine is a direct measure of the glomerular filtration rate. So if creatine is very high, then the glomerular filtration rate is very low, indicating that we really have a problem with the kidney. In this case, we have an elevated blood urea nitrogen, but a totally normal creatine, which is going to make us understand that this is a case of pre-renal azotemia. So azotemia is any time where we have high blood urea nitrogen or creatinine and this can be pre-renal, renal, or post-renal. In this case, we know that it's pre-renal because like I said, creatine is normal and in renal causes, creatine would be elevated, creatinine, by the way. And in post-renal, and we can also, we can double check this by looking at the urine specific gravity. If our creatine is normal and our urine specific gravity is normal, then it shows that the kidneys are functioning because they are still able to concentrate urine. And if we look at our urine specific gravity, it's right here. And as long as for dogs, it is over 1.030, it is in a super good normal range. So we can actually conclude that this is pre-renal azotemia because creatine is normal and urine specific gravity is also normal so the kidneys can still concentrate the urine so it's not the kidneys themselves that are hurt but there's something not going entirely right with excretion moving to the next one now we get to the really interesting finding which is our glucose is almost off the charts it should be three between three and six and we actually have this crazy number of 34 here right now um, obviously, we're all thinking about the same thing when we see a really, really whole glu high glucose value, which so we're going to do a really quick check with our urinalysis to see what's going on with the glucose there. And I think none of you are too surprised to see this really lots of glucose in the pee. So this we call glucosuria because there's glucose in the urine. And this is a direct consequence of just large amounts of glucose in the plasma. And this together is actually means that we can now give a diagnosis. <laughs> of diabetes mellitus because there's such a high plasma glucose and so much glucosuria. Now, when we think about diabetes mellitus, there are certain really dangerous uh, and emergency situation complications that can arise um, in untreated diabetic patients. And so the most dangerous one of this is diabetic ketoacidosis. So let's look at our urinalysis again to look at our ketones. And we will see now that not is there glucose in the urine, there's also ketones in the urine. So there is ketonuria in this patient. And this is pretty much confirming for us right now that not only is this patient diabetic, the patient is actually in a state of diabetic ketoacidosis. So this is an emergency. And I will mention that the acidosis hasn't been confirmed because for all of you paying attention, we have no measurements of the pH of our patient, but it is confirmed that it's a diabetic patient with ketones in high overload. So diabetic ketotic patient. And what are the symptoms from cis metabolic acidosis? They are lethargy, vomiting, and that's exactly what our patient is presenting with. So even though we haven't measured the metabolic acidosis yet, we can give a pretty confident diagnosis that this patient is in diabetic ketoacidosis. So let's look at what else was showing up on our lab results here. We really understand this glucose. And now we can take a look at our liver values. So we see that all four of our liver values are actually, all four of these liver enzymes are increased. When we look at ALT and AST, these are our general liver enzymes. So we've got a moderate increase in ALT and AST. So we can say this might point to hepatopathy. Now what's going on with our other two liver enzymes? These two are more indicative of 
problems happening in the bile duct. And they are also uh, raised to a larger degree. So we're going to say this is a marked raise in level. Um, so we might have a pathopathy with some cholestatic component. Because ALKP and GGT are present in the cells of the bile duct. So if there's damage there, then we're going to see them show up really pretty highly. And ALT and AST are more general. They are coming from the liver parenchyma itself. So why would we have some liver changes going on in our patient? Well, this is pretty common in untreated diabetics because the insulin deficiency leads to hepatic lipidosis. Basically what happens is there's a mobilization of fat stores because glucose metabolism is almost impossible because insulin isn't working. So instead there's a mobilization of fat stores and this leads to fatty infiltration of the hepatocytes which causes fat vacuoles in the liver this is damaging and raises the level of the enzymes. So that's actually a, a pretty normal consequence of our untreated diabetic patient. Now, the last finding we have here on our biochemistry, together, a high cholesterol and high triglycerides we call hyperlipidemia. And now understanding that these liver changes are caused by hepatic lipidosis, so fat mobilization, you would also understand that our patient has hyperlipidemia. So this is actually totally in check with the fact that our patient is an untreated diabetic. The last thing I'd like to note here on the urinalysis is that we have a trace amount of proteins that are present in the urine, which really should not really be there. Um, and we looked earlier at the total protein here, which is really barely slightly elevated. So uh, total protein tends to be elevated in case of dehydration, because if we have less blood volume, then the protein relative is going to be more in it. And this is also confirmed by a hematocrit that is in the higher side of the range, that we have a mildly dehydrated patient. And it's a bit common sense when we think about the fact that our patient has been throwing up for the past 24 hours. These are just pointing towards dehydration in our patient. Now, those are all my notes on the lab results of this patient that we have now confidently diagnosed with diabetic ketoacidosis. I hope this was a bit of a help to you and a bit of a practice in reading some of these lab results and I'm planning to do a lot more so if you enjoy this type of video then please let me know in the comments and you can be looking forward to more videos like this because I personally really enjoy going over uh, these types of numbers and details and understanding and learning to read what our case is telling us. So that's all for today and see you next time.